What do you think of when you hear abstraction? Many of you have heard the old line, what's so special about that? My kid could do that. However, there is far more than meets the eye with abstract painting. Many abstract artists spent time practicing the elements of art and design, the intricacies of painting naturalistically and how paint functions as a medium before they evolved into abstract painters. These painters learned to master the rules in order to know how to best break them. Levels of abstraction in art go from photorealistic to non-objective. Naturalism is what we would consider realism or a very realistic painting, while photorealism is when it's difficult to discern between a painting and a photograph. Abstract art aims to explore and exaggerate forms seen in the world. Abstract art varies from light abstraction to heavy abstraction. For example, Van Gogh's works, though representative, use simplification of forms and exaggeration of color to abstract his subjects and convey emotion through paint. Non-objective art, however, depicts no subject that exists physically and therefore represents no existing object, hence non-objective. Non-objective painting is often more about pure formalism, the rules of aesthetics and elements of art, or concept over representing subjects in paint. For this module, however, we'll focus on light to moderate abstraction. There are many ways artists focus on their subjects to create an abstract work. A way to think about abstraction is to consider how artists exaggerate one or several elements of design to take observed forms and transform them into a new work. Remember the design elements are color, form, line, shape, space, texture, and value. We will forgo value and form as examples in this module as value is an inherent part of color and form refers to objects in the third dimension. We will instead focus on other elements as tools for abstraction. This project is an exercise in composition, color, and abstraction. The artists in this module have been selected with their abstraction of an individual element or combination of elements in mind. Going forward, you will be emulating one of these artists and their techniques to create your own abstract work. With each individual artist we look at, think about how they construct their work. What paint applications are they using? Are they using a broad brush, a small brush, impasto, smooth application, stippling? How do they use color? What color scheme are they using? How do they treat shapes? Are they rendered dimensionally or flat? How do they use paint to represent texture? Are textures stylized or rendered naturalistically? How do they use composition? How are they using the space of their picture plane? Even the most seemingly arbitrary paintings here have some aspect of composition. These will all be aspects of your work that I will look for in your final abstract painting. We'll explore shape, color, and texture and how Paul Cezanne used these to abstract his works. Paul Cézanne is possibly one of the most influential painters of the 19th and early 20th century. He is what one might call a painter's painter. Cézanne's work focused primarily on the flatness of painting, puzzling over why we make three-dimensional illusions on two-dimensional planes. He investigated this issue by exploring the nature of the materials. He did this by exploring texture, such as the viscosity of paint and the roughness of canvas. He would leave spots of canvas unpainted to bring awareness to the illusion of representational painting. Cezanne would often apply his colors to the canvas in a series of methodical brushstrokes, as though he were constructing the picture rather than painting it. Focusing on texture, he would often use a palette knife to apply thick, deliberate layers of pigment, calling attention to the material quality of paint. Furthermore, Cezanne worked in abstraction by reducing objects into their simpler shapes. Apples become spheres, fabric would be transformed into prisms, and other objects would be broken down into their corresponding geometric forms, such as cubes, cones, cylinders, etc. Cezanne would also break down colors from the complex gradients which model a form and transform them into groups of flat patches set next to each other. He would lay pure color on top of pure color rather than blend it. He eventually rejected strict classical perspective. This allowed perspective to be based on the relationships between objects than on one single point. Altogether, this led to the impression that he was examining an object from multiple sides at once. Through his investigations and paintings, Cezanne was able to use abstraction of shape, color, texture, and space to produce some really groundbreaking work. Let's now move into how artists explored abstraction of space with the Cubists.
Cubism was one of the major artistic movements of the 20th century. It abandoned traditional techniques of perspective and foreshortening and instead seeking to capture several perspectives and angles in a single artwork using flattened geometric shapes. Cubism has its root in Cezanne's work. Cezanne emphasized two-dimensionality of the picture plane through simplistic geometric shapes. Cubism took Cezanne's study of shape into further abstraction by not only flattening forms through paint, but by breaking the space within the painting. To construct a work in Cubist vein, you would fracture a complete image into many distinct parts and rearrange those pieces into a new whole. However, just because the forms are fractured from the original observed still life does not mean the final pieces aren't arranged into a cohesive arrangement following compositional rules. Notice how in these images, despite them all being fractured, the images are reassembled in an aesthetically pleasing composition. The aim is to abstract, but also to balance. Often, cubists would use a more desaturated palette and focus on the arrangement of shapes and angles in their compositions. Often cubists would use a more desaturated palette and focus on arrangement of shapes and angles in their compositions. While the Georges Braque piece here is monochromatic, the piece by Juan Gris is very colorful but desaturated. When exploring other modes of abstraction, it's very important to understand how color will affect your work. Though cubism was the first movement that explicitly sought to abstract subjects, it's important to note, however, that those subjects, though flattened and deconstructed, remained rooted in the art historical tradition of still lifes, portraiture, and landscapes. Furthermore, by combining multiple perspectives at once, the cubists aimed to capture the complex experience of sight and artistically reflect a more active representation of the world. We'll continue our exploration into abstraction of color by looking at the pointillists. Pointillism is an intensely meticulous technique relying on stippling. Pointillists like Georges Seurat and Paul Signac aim to apply pure color to their canvases and let the hues mix in the viewer's eye. He believed this would create a more striking image than one made by mixing colors on a palette. Seurat believed the saturation of colors could be enhanced by the juxtaposition of complementary colors, which enhanced each other's intensity through opposition color theory. Laying blue and orange next to each other, instead of mixing them, would cause the colors themselves to become more vibrant than if they were mixed. You can think of this mixing in the eye as pixels on a screen. Each pixel, or point, is a single saturated color and blends with the hues next to it in its proximity. While Seurat's work is far more precise and dot-focused, Paul Signac was able to achieve similar results with more of a short stroke than dots. Signac's colors also were more saturated and abstracted than Seurat's. Notice in the picture here, Signac uses cool hues of blue-violet next to red-orange. He's not mixing hues the same way Seurat did, but rather rendering three-dimensional forms in shadow with color complements rather than simply value. By using saturation and hue rather than value, artists can give their painting a feel of dimensionality without sacrificing vibrance of color. We can see different applications of pointillism by looking at the painting here by Jean Mexniger. Here the painter is using various mixes of flesh tones to provide form to the woman's face. The color of her dress is mixes of whites and violets to convey shape and depth. Large swaths of points covering the surface of the work mix individually in the viewer's eye. This creates a lush, saturated work. With these three artists, you can see how the size of the brushstroke, or stipple, also affects the appearance of the final piece. When painting a pointless work, consider the size of the brush or dot you would use. The smaller your points, the more nuanced the color shifts will be, while larger dots will abstract the piece a little further. If you choose to explore this technique, focus on making your dots as uniform in size as possible. As we studied in Module 2, color has three elements, hue, value, and saturation. Hue is the name of the color, value is the lightness or darkness of a color, and saturation being the intensity or purity of the color. Fauvism was a movement in the early 20th century focusing on emotional power of color. The leading Fauvis was Henry Matisse. His career was based on studying the intensity and beauty of color and color interactions. His works used intensely saturated colors and little modeling of form. Rather than using modeling or shading to render volume through his pictures, Matisse used contrasting areas of pure color. He used his understanding of color theory to execute many of his works. 
His paintings may look randomly colored, but he would begin with a selected color scheme. If you choose this artist to emulate, you too will need to devise a color scheme. I advise looking back to Module 2 for inspiration on how to construct your palette. Often because of the intense color usage and limited palette, Matisse's forms would flatten. However, notice the green vase here. Instead of modeling the form through a full shadow structure, its modest three-dimensionality is suggested by the yellow highlights. Matisse would indicate form rather than fully render it. However, this does not mean he just drew flat shapes and painted them in. Rather, the color was applied first before the lines were applied. Composition was also chief among his concerns in painting, with Matisse striving for simple yet harmonious arrangements of objects. Vincent van Gogh was a contemporary of Cézanne and Seurat. Odds are you're somewhat familiar with him, if not some of his works. Van Gogh is essentially a household name. However, his work is a beautiful example of how to explore abstraction through texture and color. His works are easy to spot as they all have the telltale characteristic of expressive use of paint and thick impasto. Van Gogh used a variety of mark making to create his work, relying on heavy surface texture to abstract forms. He used this abstraction of color and texture to charge his paintings with expressive energy. Van Gogh would cover the entire canvas with an uneven ripple effect, using thick brushstrokes to both model his forms as well as create physical and implied textures. His use of impasto gives his work a thick, energetic consistency. With the help of a palette knife, brush, or spatula, the marks made retain an uneven texture and give the overall works a more expressive feel. Employing impasto affords a level of play to a painting. You can use various methods of mark making, rather than slow builds of color or simply coloring in the lines. In the painting of shoes, you can see how Van Gogh used different approaches to similar subjects. The nails of the sole of the boot are represented by quick, thick daubs of paint. Some of the modeling of form is conveyed through cross-hatching. Thick paint builds up the background and nestles the shoes within its blue form. The clogs, however, are more deliberately executed with hatching lines used to build the shape and convey three-dimensional form. Notice how the hatching lines move along the planes of the clogs, while the dashes of paint on the background follow the plane of the floor. These sunflowers show how various marks can convey texture differently. The delicate petals of the flower executed with broader brush strokes seem soft compared to the small, quick, thickly applied stippling in the flower center. This move from small and intense marks to large, broad marks aids the composition's radial qualities. In Module 2, we explored a bit on how Van Gogh used color. Despite his tendency to work from life, his color schemes were chosen and manipulated to abstract the observed colors of his subjects. This color alteration is used to enhance the psychological and emotional effects of his objects. By constructing color schemes, Van Gogh was able to change how the viewer feels about a subject or space. Consider the softer colors of the painting of the artist's room, which is executed with a saturated yet harmonious palette. By using a tetradic color scheme of balanced hues, he creates an inviting space. Compare this with the acidic contrasting colors of the pool hall. The intense lime green and blood red of the walls fight for attention and can cause a sense of unwelcoming unease. Aiming to convey intense emotions in color, Van Gogh utilized his understanding of color theory to elevate the emotional impact of these scenes. Nicholas de Stahl's work straddles the line between pure abstraction and figurative representation. What seems at first glance to be flat slowly reveals space through perspective, color interactions, and the overlap of thickly painted shapes. His work suggests forms and objects more than overtly describing them. His work, like that of the Cubist and Cezanne, relied heavily on the carefully constructed compositions of the picture plane. De Stahl was interested in the suggestion of volume, space, and distinct forms reduced to the most basic shapes, hinting at the objects he observed without giving in to a completely figurative process. De Stahl became known for a thick impasto technique involving wide planes of color loosely suggestive of the plane fracturing exercises of the cubists. Often applying his paint with a spatula or palette knife, de Stahl created sculpted and ridged canvases which helped him reduce his subjects into broad geometric swaths of color. Here we can see de Stahl's technique at play in his painting Portrait of Anne. Here at first glance we might notice that the work is a flat series of broad areas of color. If we linger on the image for just a moment, we may start to notice the odd arrangements of these shapes. The green is cut into by blue and red, suggesting overlap, which then suggests depth. We might start to notice then that perhaps the red and blue shapes might resemble a face with long blue hair. 
This might lead us to notice more shapes that begin to resemble parts of the body. The bent red knee and the extended beige leg break into the neutral colors in the foreground. We notice then that the forms combined suggest the form of a woman in profile sitting upon a blue-black shape, most likely a chair with drapery. What is now clearly a portrait of a model was a few moments ago just a series of shapes. De Stahl organized his painting through careful organization of space and shape. His palette at first glance may seem haphazard, but closer inspection shows a deliberate tetradic color scheme. The value of his hues ground the work which allows for the brighter, more saturated colors to come forward. His neutrals are the tints or shades of his base colors and allow the eye to rest in between areas of full saturation. While there is no modeling or shade rendered in the work, the style still created a painting which bridges the gap between two-dimensional design and representing three-dimensional form. By plotting his shapes and colors carefully, he created this beautifully abstract portrait of a young woman. Giorgio Morandi was an eminent Italian artist known for his subtly colored still-life paintings of ceramics. His works, clearly based on his influences, Cezanne and Surratt, explore shape, color, and texture to create harmonious works. While his color schemes seem muted, Morandi strove towards compositional balance and harmonies of color. The small areas of saturated hue in his paintings are points of interest in otherwise restrained works. At first glance, we may see bright whites and dark, pure blacks. However, looking closer, we can notice his darks are built with several successive layers of pigment. His whites, too, are not overtly bright and are often simply tints of a hue applied from a dark to a light. Through texture of his brushwork and light impasto, Morandi gives his objects a weighty architectural feel. The minimal use of shade and highlight hints at three-dimensionality while giving the subjects a timeless and monumental presence. Subtle occlusion shadows ground the vessels to the foreground, while the slight indication of cast shadows give the cluster of objects a crowded feel. His composition's use of negative space is a bit unusual, yet it balances the hefty collection of objects and gives them visual room to breathe. According to Morandi, his work is based on the notion of communicating quiet, tranquility, and privacy. His subtle abstractions of shape, space, and texture communicates these qualities masterfully. Richard Diebenkorn began as a non-objective painter who moved into more figurative abstraction later in his career. Inspired by the likes of Matisse and Destel, his paintings focus on harmonies of shape and color. Like Destel, Diebenkorn worked on his streetscapes, landscapes, interiors, and still lives through reducing the figurative forms of his subjects into more basic areas of shape and color. While Destel's work is more constructed of stacked color patches, Diebenkorn's paintings are more organized into orderly geometric areas of color. Although the artist was inspired by the forms and colors he saw in his surroundings, the resulting work is technically an abstraction of those hues. Diebenkorn altered them to fit into a harmonious color scheme that enhanced yet reflected the original source material. Built with a balanced series of flat shapes executed with subtle and sophisticated layers of color, his work creates an abstract yet familiarly intimate space. Though her paintings could be considered naturalistic, Kathleen Rayfeld takes advantage of loose brushwork and abstractions of color to create an incredibly vivid work. Like Cezanne, she focuses on the materiality of paint. Using large, broad brushes and large patches of color, she breaks down her subjects into areas of color rather than form. By starting with black canvas, she adds color, working against dark achromatic backgrounds to create paintings akin to stained glass. Starting with black, she makes color pop out of the darkness and start to make forms and compositions on the canvas. Working from dark to light, she builds colors with quick glazes before adding deliberate strokes of intense hue. Using these deliberate brushstrokes and highly saturated colors, she emulates texture, generalizing the physical texture of her subject and translating it through tactile brushwork. These paintings look quickly made, but each stroke is considered before being applied. For this assignment, you will create the same painting twice, one naturalistic and one abstracted. Your painting should include three to five objects or one portrait model. Your abstracted painting should be in the stylistic approach of an artist covered today or use similar techniques of abstraction. Remember, this is a three-week assignment and has two paintings due, so schedule your time accordingly. I recommend working on both at the same time. You will need two surfaces, 11 by 14 or above, your painting kit, and a color wheel. Using a digital color wheel will be fine.
For the first painting, select your still life materials and do three thumbnails exploring values and composition. Grid or draw your work on one of the surfaces. Again, I recommend gridding as it'll get you to the painting stage a lot faster. For the naturalistic painting, work your way up from underpainting to completed piece. Your naturalistic painting should aim to be as accurate to your source as possible and follow the rules of perspective as closely as you're able. For your abstract piece, choose a stylistic option from one of the examples covered in the PowerPoint. Please note which artist you are imitating or which kinds of abstraction you are using in this piece. The artists you use must be one from the list provided. Next, create three more thumbnails based on your naturalistic painting for your next composition. Then grid or draw your work on your second surface. Create a color scheme for your abstracted piece. It can be close to your selected object's local color or exaggerated by changing the intensity, or you can invent your own specific color scheme. Once you're finished with your project, please submit one source photo, two thumbnail drawings of your abstract composition, two thumbnail drawings of your naturalistic painting, two in-progress photos of the naturalistic painting, two in-progress photos of the abstract painting, one final photo of your naturalistic painting, one final photo of your abstract painting. Finally, submit one photo of your color scheme and a sentence or two of the stylistic approach or artist you chose. The photo should resemble the one pictured here. In all, that's 12 images to upload to Canvas. The rubric for this assignment can be found on the PowerPoint and also the assignment sheet. Please refer to that for what to submit and how I will be grading.